So last week I spoke a sermon about an infamous woman. Her name, nobody knows. But how Jesus reached her. And I shared a little bit about how sometimes we can, we can walk as believers with eyes that are condemning and judging of others. And I shared with us that the point I was trying to, to bring across with us is that we are to be more like Jesus. Because when the, when the Pharisees brought the woman who was caught in the act of adultery, they, they were working with the letter of the law, which is, which is good, but they didn't understand grace. And we saw the Lord direct within their heart to address the log that was in their eye rather than trying to pull out the speck that was from this woman's eye. He who is without sin cast the first stone. Self-introspection. And we discover that's very important because it's so easy to look upon others and their flaws and in their inabilities rather than look into our own lives and search our own hearts. So we discovered that last week and we discovered that in our approach of when we reach people, that we got to show the love of Jesus. This morning, I, I want, I've entitled this message, the, Un- the Unconditional Nature of Christ. The Unconditional Nature of Christ. So to understand this, we've got to go to a very familiar passage of Scripture, which is found in the book of Luke. So turn with me to Luke, book of Luke, chapter 19. And you, when I say chapter 19, those of us who've been in church life for a long time, you, if you know your Bible, you know what passage that is. Because I'm going to speak on a, on, a, on, a, on a story that you would have learned some way or the other, uh, even in Sunday school. It's the story of Zacchaeus. That's what it is. The story of Zacchaeus. So I hope to teach you more than just what you learned in Sunday school. I hope to pull out some, some truths and some, um, some, some, some gems that we could take with and apply within our lives from this very account. Right. Go to your Bibles. Luke 19. We're reading out the New King James Version. We're reading from verse 1 through to verse 10. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not, because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Lord, look, I give half of my goods to the poor, And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. Amen. So to understand this passage, first we just got to look at at the setting and look at the outlook of Luke, who is now giving us this account. The first thing that you would know, or, or you got to know, is that it is only Luke that presents this account. The other Gospels don't, don't present it. The second thing that you've got to look at in terms of Luke 19 from verse 1 through 10, through 10 you've got to look at it through the eyes of, of Luke and him writing the Gospels. And to sort of like tie all of this together, you've got to look at some other passages of Scripture to really understand the unconditional nature of Jesus Christ. And the first that I want to bring to our attention is, why it says many, is Luke chapter 5. It's when Jesus saw the multitude. And it was Simon Peter's boat. And he asked Simon to borrow his boat after they caught fish the entire night. And, and Simon Peter gave Jesus the boat. And the Bible would say that Jesus preached from that boat. And then he told Simon, Simon, now take your boat, because the Lord never accepts anything for free. He says, take the boat and now go. Go yonder. Go far. Go far. 
and throw your nets again. And he said, no, but we cast our nets the entire night. But because you said it, we will go. And so he takes his boat and he goes and he casts his net. And you know what happened, yeah? They caught a whole lot of fish. And they came back. And then Peter said something. He says, Lord, Lord, not me, isn't it? The Lord says, from now, you will no longer be catching, you know, fish, but you'll be a fisher of men. In other words, I'm going to use you. This is the moment that I'm calling you. But yet, in that moment, you find this, that Peter saw or thought of himself as being one who was unworthy to have any association with Jesus because he recognized his wretchedness. Hello? His sinfulness. He's, Lord, I'm unworthy. But Lord, you know, don't call me. But yet the Lord still calls him. You notice that the Lord didn't go to a doctor. He didn't go to a lawyer, a liar, you know. He didn't go to some prominent, highly educated person. He went to one who was a fisherman who thought of himself as, I'm too brash, I'm too harsh, I'm not the one that, that you can use. I'm a wretched man. But yet the Lord went to him, which speaks of his unconditional nature and how he reaches people. That even when Peter saw himself as unworthy, the Lord called him. Well, what about when the Lord went to Simon the Pharisee's house in Luke 7? And as the Lord reclines at the table, there's a woman of the night who we further come to know with other Gospels, uh, and in their account, which is in, 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 in Matthew chapter, uh, sorry, Mark chapter 14, uh, and even John gives the account of it in, in John chapter 12 that this person who comes to Simon's house is the, is the woman who we know as Mary Magdalene. And the description and how she's described in the, in, 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 in the book of Luke is that she's one that everybody knew who she was. And who was she? You see, they, they were looking at her in, through the eyes of her sinfulness, which was she was a woman of the night. Woman of the night, not that she liked the night. She liked to do things in the night. Not cook and clean. No, no, she was, she was a prostitute. And then she comes into Simon's house and she breaks open the alabaster jar and she pours it into the feet of Jesus and she wets his feet with her tears and she wipes his feet with her hair. And Simon stands there with such arrogance, if we may use that word, and with such ignorance, thinking that the Lord knows nothing about, about nothing. And sometimes how arrogant we are, we think that the Lord knows nothing about nothing. So we think we can think thoughts that the Lord can't, he doesn't know. Hello? But the Lord knows everything. You with me? You hear? The Lord knows everything. He's everywhere. He's all-knowing. David even said, if I make my bed in hell, you are there. So he knows everything about us, the ins and outs. The ups and the downs. So even when, even, even Jesus said this, is in, the Lord already knows even before you could ask him of the need you already have. So he's all-knowing. So in all-knowing, Simon thought that the Lord doesn't know. It was only he that knew. How arrogant is that? How proudful is that? To think he's the only one that knows who, who this lady Mary is. Hello? Jesus already knew. Nothing could, not, nothing could hide from, from his presence. Nothing. Nothing. You ever come across people who just know everything? <laughs> Hello. But they also see everything. And you think they didn't see it, but they saw it. Anybody? They saw it. Caught it the caught of the eye. I saw it. Yeah. But Jesus is bigger than that. And he knew, he knew who this was touching his feet. Others thought that he doesn't know. But he knew. And but what, what is revealed once again is his unconditional nature. When you say unconditional nature, what are you saying, Lord, uh, Pastor? The Lord's love, his mercy and his kindness, that he allows somebody to touch his feet who he knew was a prostitute. Who else? But I think one of the most powerful scriptures that is ever written, and a powerful scripture that can ever be preached on and ever be told about, is when Jesus is hanging around sinners and publicans. Pharisees see that. 
And they mumble amongst themselves and murmur amongst themselves. This man sits with sinners. And he responds by saying in Luke 15 of three beautiful stories of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son. That a father will go in search and in pursuit and will wait for when that son comes back home. Goes in search of that one lost sheep that's gone astray. Go in search of that lost, or the one lost coin that has fallen somewhere along the wayside. It speaks about who he is. God our Father. And it is with that picture in mind, and in that setting, and in that context of these passages of Scripture that Luke has been speaking about through his gospel, that he now gives an account that he only gives of a moment of when Jesus came into Jericho. And I'll tell you the story. When you start looking through the eyes of how Luke has been depicting to us who Jesus is thus far. And we start seeing it through, you start to see it. Otherwise, you'll miss it. If you don't, if you don't see it through, through Luke 5, 7, and 15, you won't be able to see it. All you'll know, there was a short man climbed a tree, Jesus went to his house for tea, go home. But that's not the story. Because you've got to look at verse 7, when everybody stood around and said, this man welcomes sinners. The story, Jesus comes to Jericho, an amazing place. Many things happened here in this place called Jericho. People were healed, people were set free, and walls came tumbling down. And within this city called Jericho, there's a man called Zacchaeus. One of the few times that you find in the Bible where people's names were being mentioned. What do you know about this man called Zacchaeus? Well, Zacchaeus, firstly, was of very short stature. He was a short guy. How short he was, nobody knows. But he was short. And apart from him being short, he was also a very rich man. But how did he gain his riches? He gained it through devious ways. He was a, he was a tax collector, but a chief of one. And what he did was that he overcharged people. He took money from them that was not supposed to be taken. And so by so doing, it, it made him rich. And so people didn't like him because of his devious ways. So they threw him out as an outcast. So he hears that Jesus is coming to Jericho. And when he hears that Jesus is coming to Jericho, he does something because of his short nature and stature. The Bible says this, that he climbs a sycamore tree. When he climbs a sycamore tree, he goes up because he just wants to see this Jesus. Yeah? He just wants to see this Jesus. And now as Jesus comes by, Jesus stops at this tree. Because why? Such levels of faith will always move God. So he stops and says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house, not for tea, but I'm coming to stay. New King James Version says that. I'm coming to stay in your house. I'm coming to abode in your house. Nobody, I, I, I would think, would have expected Jesus to say that. Because what they would have expected Jesus to say, Zacchaeus, how dare you take all these people's money? How could you make yourself rich? How dare you take from the rich to feed yourself? How dare do you take from the poor? You are not a Robin Hood to steal from the rich and give to the poor. You steal from the rich to keep for yourself. Yeah. How dare? That's the expectation. Zacchaeus, you're going to hell. That's what the expectation probably would have been from the people that were with Jesus. Because wherever Jesus went, throngs of people followed him. Throngs of people. And so, as Jesus comes to the sycamore, and these words, I'm coming to your house to stay, that would have rocked all those that were there. Because now you see their response. And their response is this. He welcomes sinners. And I will presume and assume, more often than not, that will be the response of many of us when we are sit here in this room. That we will carry the same response of You know what can help for this? You know who those people are? Are they bluffing their friend Jesus? Okay. I've got to wait to see if they found Jesus. Hello. We carry such 
reservations in our lives. And we carry such, sometimes such destructive um, ways. Like, without realizing, the Pharisees and those who were gathering there who said that Jesus welcomes sinners, that could have been so destructive. That could have turned somebody away from the Lord. We find this is that it's now at the sycamore that all of this is going on. So the Bible says, as the Lord speaks to Zacchaeus, he says, come, come quick, make haste. I'm coming to your house this day. Zacchaeus with haste, and the Bible says, joyfully. You're coming to my house? To me? You know everybody throws me aside. You know everybody has written me off. You know that everybody thinks I'm a rogue. Hello? You know, um, I've realized this about life. Whatever you tell the people, eventually they start to believe it. If you decide to build people up, eventually they'll start believing that. But if you break them down, eventually, you know they also start believing that. Because our words have the power to bring forth life or death. And here you find this is that Zacchaeus joyfully comes down the tree. And he welcomes Jesus to his house. And something happens. In the meeting of Jesus, his life is never the same. What, what does he do? The Bible says, he says to the Lord, Lord, I'll give half of my goods to the poor. And whatever I have taken, I will return back in fourfold. You know what that is? It's this. That if we've said that we've met with Jesus, we should never be the same again. Amen? If you truly say, I've met with Jesus, your life should not be the same. Because his transforming power should change your life. How could we say, I met with Jesus, but I still live the same? I still speak the same. I still treat people the same. I still act the same. I still do life the same. Then we didn't meet Jesus. We met the wrong Jesus. Maybe you met Jesus, the wrong one. <laughs> you met Jesus. Yeah, that's who you met. You met Jesus. Place for Arsenal. Yeah, that's the one you. You didn't meet Jesus, the Messiah. Because whenever people came into contact with him, their, life, their lives were changed, not him. You see, we meet him but still stay the same. You see, our lives must change when we meet Jesus. Because what happened? When you look at Zacchaeus, the response of Zacchaeus, I'll give half of my goods away and I will return in fourfold everything I've taken. That's, that's only a response that can come from when you meet Jesus. When you meet Jesus. We call that repentance and restitution. So repentance is when you turn from your ways and restitution is when you make right. When you make right. I was sharing this with the earlier services. That you see, I make, uh, like, like repentance is it's easy. In the sense of when I say easy, because we talk to an unseen God. So it's easy to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I, w I, will, not do it, I will not do it again, Lord. Because he's not seen. But then, the requirement of salvation and a heart that is regenerated, which is born again, there's a requirement of going and making right with the one that you're wrong. Now, that involves humility. And oh no, how can I go? How can I go and say sorry to somebody? No, Jesus will help that person. Jesus, Jesus will make it. He'll make it. Jesus will, will, will heal their heart. No. The trueness of salvation is repentance and regeneration, but also restitution. When we make why? Because we would have hurt people. We would have failed people. So an example. An example is this. Imagine that Justin, he bought a car. And he brought it to me as the mechanic. Right? I'm just using this as an example. Right? You know that it's not going to happen. But anyway. Firstly, 
that he's going to drive one car. He's got a license on driving. So that's what I'm saying is going to happen. Not that I'm going to be the mechanic. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But he brought it to me, right? Justin brought his car to me to fix his car. And so what I did was, I took parts from Ashton's car, because Ashton's car is also there, and I fixed his car. Right? So I took the hooter from his car, and I took everything, and I finished it, and then he brought it to it. And then that car is still like puffing and puffing all the way. It's not fixed. And then he's phoning me, and he's phoning me, and he's phoning me. But what I did, I eventually, I said, I'm coming tomorrow, I'm coming tomorrow, I'm coming tomorrow, I'm coming tomorrow. I'll fix it, don't worry, I'll make it right. My brother, I'll make it right. Don't worry, don't worry. Jesus loves you, I'll make it right. Hello, you come across Christian businessmen that way, and women. I don't worry, Jesus loves you, I'll make it right. Bumper sticker says nine, Psalm 91, the other one says Psalm 23, and then Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, it's my life. Then, and like, and then he's calling me because I'm not fixing this car. And then eventually, I put my phone off. As soon as I know it's Justin calling, because my phone says, Justin, and then I like, don't answer the phone. How many people have come across in that way? Jesus loves you, my brother, but we're not making right with the things we've done wrong. How can that heart be regenerated? It can't. You see what a, a regenerative heart would do? Is this, Justin? Right. You own a Toyota or whatever it is, Justin, you're like, right. I need to be honest with you, Justin. So this is what I did. Justin, I took all the parts. Another man in car, his name is Ashton. I took it from the wreck. And the reason why your car is not working, that's what I did. But you see, I've met Jesus. And Jesus has been ministering to my heart. And the right thing for me to do, Justin, is this. I need to fix the car. So what do you do? Take it to Toyota. Truly, I can't fix it. Take it to Toyota. Get a quote for that car to be repaired. And I'll be clever. And I'll pay for it. And you have my word. I'll have it. And then I go to Ashton. I said, Ashton, when you're pressing your hooter, you're wondering why the boot is opening. Well, the reason is because your hooter is not even there. It's not even there. I did an abracadabra out of it, and I put it in another man's car. But I'll fix yours as well. You see, what we do as, as believers, we play games. And this is no game. Because when you find Jesus, you are never the same. I can tell you of my life that I used to live. But I'm no longer. Because when you meet Jesus, you can never be the same. Because Zacchaeus, when he met Jesus, when he truly met Jesus, there was no change. Because you see, the fourfold, what does that represent? Restitution. I took a hundred rand from him unlawfully, but I'm going to give him back 400. Why? It is to make right and restitution. Because why? I met Jesus and I carry a repentant heart to him and it's displayed through my actions to him. And that's what the story starts to show of when you meet Jesus. His life was never the same. And then the Bible says, truly, salvation has come to this house today, for he's become a son of Abraham. Meaning, the blessing of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is even this man's, Zacchaeus. It's even his. Because salvation has come to this house. Verse 10. The Lord then gives his mission. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. You gotta look at that word lost first. In the Greek, it means damaged or ruined. His primary mission is not to give you a husband or a wife or to provide you a job 
or to, you know, to bless you with this and to bless you with that. Because very often, our whole reason of serving the Lord is because of what he can give us. So we think he's our genie in the bottle. Take him out when we need him, put him away after that. Give me this. And then when he doesn't, like there's something wrong with him. You see his primary focus, or his rather his primary mission and his primary purpose of coming to this earth was to bring salvation. That was to take us out of darkness and bring us into this marvelous light. That's why. So he came to seek. That means he's in search of. And to save. You can't save anybody. The ones who are lost. And that's the story of that day. So what's the significance? What do we learn? Firstly, what we learn is the Lord Jesus' purpose. I just shared that now. His purpose of coming to this earth was to seek and to save that which is lost. So well, how do we apply that in our lives? That's what we, want. we must be as a church. We must be reaching the lost. We must be reaching the lost. In our lives, in our missions, we must be reaching the lost. We must be praying for those who are lost. For our families who don't know Jesus, we must pray for them. I mean, we have prayer requests. Lord, give me a car, give me a house, give me a cell phone, help me in my studies. And all that is well and good, and we should. We should be praying for that. But what about the lost? What about that unsaved brother that you have? Or that unsaved sister that you have? Or that unsaved nephew that you may have? Or that unsaved niece that you may have? Or that unsaved uncle that you may have? Or that unsaved parents that you may have? Or that unsaved son and daughter that you may have? What about them being on that list to say, Lord, bring salvation. Lord, bring salvation. Lord, let them find you. Let them find you. Lord, on that road when we all know we all go through seasons of loss or disappointment, or we know seasons of difficulties come our way. Lord, in those seasons that they enter into that will come part of life, may in that season their eyes will open. Like the prodigal, Lord Jesus, who had to come to the place of losing everything and sit in a pigsty, and then he had to have a realization that at my father's house, the servants are treated better. His eyes opened. Praying for the lost. That's the mission of Jesus, that he came to seek and to save that which is lost. We have to align our hearts to those who are lost. Because when we do so, we align ourselves to Jesus. The second thing that we, got to, we will discover through this passage is Zacchaeus' faith. You see, when Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was coming, he could have so easily, you know, because of his stature and of his height that he couldn't see the Lord, he could have just went away. As usual, went to his house because you know now he had a house because Jesus said, I'm coming to stay at your house. So he could have just gone to his home. But instead, what did he do? That though he was facing challenges, or though he was unable to because of his limitations, he found a way. He got up onto a tree so that he could see the Lord. That speaks to me about steps of faith. When you move towards the Lord, steps of faith. That you move above the challenge, or you move above the restrictions that will limp or, or place limitations on you. You move above it, and you climb the tree. Because who knows that the Lord may come and stand under that tree and say, I'm coming to you today. What drew him to you is the steps of faith. And you see, the, the, the thing is that we all have limitations. Every one of us that sits here, my limitations are my eyesight. Yours might be something else. But what is the steps of faith that is being evidenced to the Lord? What does he see? Are we just sitting down under the, like under the tree and hoping maybe he'll stop by? Or are you willing to climb that tree and, 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 and put the effort behind so that indeed your step of faith will, will, will cause him to stop by? Every step that you take as a child of God should be steps of faith. And Zacchaeus, when he climbed that tree, it was revealing some steps of faith. And therefore the Lord stopped at his house. third thing is the unconditional nature of Jesus. You see, when everyone threw him out and everyone threw others out, even when Peter saw himself as unworthy, and even when people saw Mary as the one who is like the woman of the night, and last week we discovered, you know, about even the woman at the well, when I need go through Samaria, even when you look at even, even the woman who was caught in the act of adultery, when people threw people aside, even in the Bible, and even in life today, when people throw people aside, what you can know is this, is the unconditional nature of Jesus that will stop by. 
that his love reaches beyond. It goes beyond. It goes further. His grace goes further. His mercies are new every morning. That he's a loving God. And his love is unconditional. We love with conditions. He loves unconditionally. In Romans 5, the Bible says this, and it's my favorite scripture. You'll hear me all the time. I, 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 I quote it. Why? Because it's, 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 it's always been revelation to my heart that God demonstrated his love in this, that whilst we had sinners, Christ died for us. It was not when I was in my perfect state. It's not, it wasn't when on, on, on September 11th, 1997, when I gave my heart to the Lord, that's when Jesus started to love me. He loved me before that. But you see, I didn't know of it until I came to the saving grace of him. Then I realized how much he loves me, that his love wasn't when I said yes to him. His love for me was even when I was living in my old way of sinfulness. That's how much he loves us. His love goes beyond the fallings and the failings of our lives. His love is unconditional. It's unmerited. There's nothing you can do to earn that love of his. Nothing. Nothing. When you look at this passage of scripture, it was when, when, when Zacchaeus met the Lord, then he gave half his, of his good to the, to the poor. It wasn't him giving it first so that Jesus maybe will stop by. Sometimes we think that our good deeds, now that's where Jesus will, will love us more. So we try through the works of, of our hands and through the works of our lives, of, of, of good deeds, thinking that that's going to earn more love from God. But you don't have to do that to earn his love. His love is unconditional. It's unmerited. The cross speaks of his unconditional love for every one of us. And this passage speaks about his unconditional love and his mercy and his grace. Because when others threw Zacchaeus aside, he stops at Zacchaeus' house. It signifies in all of our lives that we are to be like him and how he sees us. The fourth thing we discover from this passage of Scripture is the truth of salvation. Not only do we, do we see the Lord's purpose in the story, not only do we um, discover of his unconditionalness through this passage of scripture, not only do we see Zacchaeus' faith, but we also discover the truth of salvation that I shared already, repentance and restitution is a reflection of a heart that is regenerated, that is born again. If you claim to be born again, it reveals itself through a heart that is repentant. And through a heart that would make right. It's not reflected through the songs and through church attendance and through doing church things. It's revealed through how we treat others that we've done that. And lastly, what we discover within this passage is the need to be more like Jesus in a lost world. There are many who are like Zacchaeus. There are many who are like Peter. There are many who are like Mary. There are many who are like the prodigal in our world. Now, we could stand on the side as being like the Pharisees and saying, oh, this man, he welcomes sinners. Or we can be more like And I pray that we become more like him. Because you see, when people see you and when they see me, what they see is imperfect people 
the love deeds and your reflections in everyday life. Not just when we're in this building. It's easy to be like Jesus when we're in this building. It's easy to treat everybody kindly in this building. Oh, no, you sit there, my brother. No, 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 you sit there. Do the same when you're in the bus or in the taxi. No, you sit there, my brother. I'll stand. You take that seat. It's easy to show courtesy and kindness when people are looking at you. But what about when nobody is around? That's when the trueness of when we say we are, have a regenerated heart, a born-again heart is revealed. Public places, it's easy to do that. This is when you stand in a queue and it's so easy to lose your mind. When you see that taxi driver and it's so easy to lose your heart and lose your way. When somebody wrongfully does something, it's so easy to lose ourselves. Some of us may say, I lost my temper, go find it. If you lost it, go find it. Go find it. Go pick it up, put it back. Yeah, put it back. Be temperate. You see, we fail to realize we represent Christ. Not to say we're perfect, but we've got to be more like him. So when you lose your temper, go pick it up, put it back, then go back and say, I'm so sorry, I lost my temper with you. That shows a heart that is regenerated. But when we walk away and say, ah, you know what? That's not a, a heart that is regenerated. You see, in a lost, hurting, bruised world, Jesus Christ must be revealed. And how is he going to be revealed? Through his body. What is his body? That biscuit we get at the beginning of the month? No. Body is his church, who is us. And in a lost world, and in a hurting world, when it's so easy to show condemnation and judgment, there will be people who speak the truth in love, and we must reflect Jesus. And we must become more and more like him. In John 3, the Bible says that, we, that he must increase and we must decrease. May he increase in you and may you decrease so that the character and the nature of this unconditional God be Revealed and reflected in you and me. As I conclude this morning, there's a famous passage of scripture that we know. And that's Matthew 5 16. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The same passage he speaks, and he speaks of us being salt in this earth that we live in. And I think more than now than ever before, we have to be salt. We come across people every day who are broken, who are hurting, who are abandoned, who are deemed outcasts, who are thrown aside, who are the crooks, We might say and call them the paras. <laughs> Hello. And I'm not telling them about Jesus. Show them Jesus.
Because if Jesus was walking on the face of the earth today, in his physical presence, you know where he would be? Look at Luke 15. You know, know where he would be sitting. And probably you and I would be saying, look at this man. He sits among sinners. So he's given us the mandate and the Holy Spirit. And we do life every day with friends and family and with strangers. Let us show the unconditional nature of Jesus as imprinted in and through our lives through the Holy Spirit and by a regenerated heart. May Christ be revealed in you and in me that a lost, hurting world will see this beautiful Savior that we have found. Amen. My Father, shape our hearts and our lives. That through a story that we see of a man who was deemed an outcast but can see so much when we look through the eyes of what Luke was trying to show us through in various passages to reveal your unconditional nature, Lord, of love, of mercy, of forgiveness and kindness. May we be more like you. May the trueness of salvation be found in all of us, through repentance, through restitution, and through a regenerated heart, Lord. God, my Father, I pray that this week and beyond, we come across people, Lord, who are broken, who are bruised, who are forgotten, who are the outcasts of our society. Lord Jesus, what we find through your word, it is with them that you have spent time with. It is with them that you redeemed and you reconciled and you made new. So help us, Lord, to reveal your nature and to reveal your character that is imprinted in our lives. Let it be shown out to people that come across us whether it's family, whether it's friends, whether it's fellow colleagues, whether it's people that work under us, whether it is a stranger at a shop, or maybe a stranger that we find on a street. Lord, let us reveal you and reveal the genuineness of love, of kindness, and of mercy. Father God, no one is an outcast in your eyes. Because you can redeem and reconcile and restore anyone. And if you could do that with Zacchaeus, Lord, you can do it in all of us. And I know even to the ones that are forgotten in our society, you can do it there too. Help our church to be a church that's reaching out and reaching the lost, the hurting, and the hurting. Father God, let us be more like you. That's my prayer this time. Father, bless your children as they go from here. Use them, keep them, watch over them, bless them. Be their portion and guide and their strength to each other. In Jesus' name, may the Lord bless and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord our God lift up his countenance and may he give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you, church. You stay well and you have a blessed week. Go be a blessing to others in this week. Bye-bye. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. Please click like, comment, and subscribe. Also, hit the bell notification so that you'll get a notification every single time we upload. Stay blessed.